Hello, hello, my beautiful friends, and welcome back to the Fertility Confidence Podcast. Today, we are busting three popular fertility tips, things that you've probably heard about on the internet. Maybe these are things that you've tried and no judgment coming from me, um, but three really common like tips, tricks, strategies that I see being given, but also we have clients coming into fertility confidence method that have tried these, or they are like immediate questions that they ask of like, what do you think about this? So I wanted to share just three quick things that you probably have heard about or probably have tried that actually a don't have the research to back them up and probably aren't actually helping you. And this is kind of stemming from a question I actually asked on my Instagram stories uh, last week because a friend brought this up to me. And so I, I popped into my stories and I was like, yo, where do you guys go when you have a question? And we actually got quite a lot of responses and very popular ones being to Reddit, um, to TikTok, to Google, uh, to me, which is lovely, and sometimes to the doctor. And it really got me thinking that like the community and wonderful, amazing space inside Fertility Confidence Method that we've made. And I was scrolling through the community um, and it basically is Reddit, <laughs> but with this twist of being evidence-based and you're with a group of women who are in the FCM community and, and model and share the same beliefs. And so we, I know I monitor the questions and I monitor the answers. I very rarely have to step in and go, oh, no, this is actually what the answer is or yada, yada, because we have women who even are done their fertility journey, but are still active and supportive in the community giving the answer that I would give and sharing the research. And it just makes me feel so much better for those women that even if they're not getting their advice directly from me inside their daily office hours, they are getting good advice. Whereas when you hop onto your platform of choice, there's a lot of bad advice out there and it's really scary and it's really hard to navigate. And that's honestly a very common complaint we hear from new clients coming into FCM and, and why one of the reasons they come in and join us is because they just are unsure of how to navigate all of those different options. So I just wanted to kind of like put that little plug in there for you that if you are someone that is getting their medical information off the internet. Let's make sure that it's a trusted source. Um, and Reddit might not be it. You know, that's not the vibe, right? Especially when we're talking about fertility optimization, infertility treatment, planning for pregnancy, and not wanting to waste a hell of a lot of time. Because that is obviously why you are here, right? It's why you're listening to this podcast. I imagine either you are preparing to enter this time period of your life, or you are in the thick of it right now. And like, raise your hand if you're just so sick of wasting time. And unfortunately, when we're continuing to see misinformation or poor information, or we're not giving the tools to, or we're not given the tools to navigate like what is best for me and for my body. We're often wasting time trying things and trying strategies that just simply might not work for you. Right. So let's go through the three popular fertility. I, I'm sure we can do like a part two, part three, part four, part five of this, but let's just start with three today. Um, and I would love, love to hear from you. Like what are some popular fertility tips or tricks that you've heard or tried that you're like, I don't know, is this good? Is this not? Let me know over, come follow me over on Instagram at fertility confidence method. But number one, is simply, and this is one, this is one, unfortunately, we're hearing out of the mouths of our GPs and doctor's offices um, that just don't know. They just don't know. And it's have more sex so you don't miss your fertile window. <laughs> and in theory, like logically, this kind of makes sense, right? We have this window of opportunity to get pregnant. If you're someone who doesn't track your cycle, maybe you're new in the game and you just, you're like, 
we're just going to try, right? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. It shouldn't be hard. We're just going to try. Um, it, it logically makes sense when you think about it, that more sex should therefore mean more chance, more opportunity. So as much as I'm saying that this is something that's not true, if this is your belief or was your belief, like I get it. I think it, I think it makes total sense. It's incredibly logical. Here's why it's actually not practical. So women have a very narrow window of opportunity to actually get pregnant and everyone's window of opportunity is going to be slightly different. In a perfect world, we have potentially up to five days that the sperm can survive and travel through the vaginal canal into the uterus and get back to the fallopian tubes to be able to actually do their job and create an embryo, fertilize an egg and create an embryo. Max five days. I remember personally in sex ed, back in high school, basically being told that you can get pregnant anytime at any, any day. Doesn't matter. Just don't do it. That's actually not the case. Everyone has a very window, very narrow window of opportunity that we can get pregnant. And some people's window of opportunity might be smaller if sperm health isn't great, or if vaginal canal pH isn't optimal. Now we're potentially shortening that window. And how I like to approach this is there is a research paper from, gosh, I don't know. I don't know when it's from. It's not terribly old. It's not terribly fresh, but it's not terribly old. <laughs> we'll take it. Um, any updates would be great, but we'll take what we got for now. And the paper showed that the best statistical chance to conceive was having sex two days before ovulation. It was 27% chance, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's, that's the game, right? 27% two days prior. I think it goes down to 24% the day before ovulation. So it's not that much different. So one to two days prior to ovulation is our best statistical chance of conceiving. Then outside of that, we drastically decrease on day of ovulation. It's like 8%, 10%, somewhere in that range. And day after it's zero because the egg will only survive for 24 hours. And we, three days before, uh, man, I should have totally pulled this. I should have totally pulled the chart up because now I'm just guessing. Three days before, there's still a small statistical chance, but it's drop quite drastically and we drop from there out. And then anything above five days is 0%. So best statistical chance being one to two days before ovulation. Now, let's just paint this picture, okay? Men are continuously making sperm. If you've had a semen analysis done, you will have an idea of how well his body is doing that job. If you have not had a semen analysis done, we don't really know. And to err on the side of caution, I would recommend pretending like it's not great. Why? Because for like 60% of men, it's actually not great, <laughs> unfortunately. So if you don't know these numbers, if you haven't had a semen analysis done, A, my goodness, please listen to last week's episode 131 um, and get some testing done. Like easiest thing to do. And it gives you so much information and is going to help you build out such a, a strategic and hard hitting plan if necessary. Okay. But let me go back to painting my picture. Let's just assume that they're making sperm at an okay rate. Um, but maybe it's a little bit on the low side. If you guys are having sex every single day, leading 10 days into ovulation, but the best statistical chance would be, let's say on day 11 and 12 of you guys having your daily intercourse, by that time, we've really depleted the tank. It's the best way to describe it. Yes, they're continuously making sperm, but if it's just constantly being depleted, the maturity level of those sperm over time is just going to get significantly lower. Basically can't keep up with refilling reserves, even if count is okay. We still need that time for maturation. Sperm still have a 72 day life cycle, meaning it does take time for them to reach maturity. It does take time for the good things that you're doing to help with sperm to actually take impact. But it also means that if we're quickly turning over the reserves, we're going to have more 
we're still going to maybe have a lot of sperm, but are they going to be mature? Are they going to be the right size? Are they going to be the right shape? Are they going to be able to get the job done? Maybe not as well. Now, the flip side of this coin, because now you might be saying, okay, less sex is better, is also actually not the case, right? There, there, there too is a very narrow window of optimizing here. So what we see in the literature is we also don't want men going much longer than three days without ejaculating because then sperm that are sitting stagnant are dying there's likely going to be less living and motile sperm in a sample if it's been sitting stagnant for a long period of time. So we have to find this rhythm where not too much, but not too little, and we're kind of trying to hit this window. So I think the asterisks to this, like figuring out your timing sort of conversation is first and foremost, tracking your cycle is incredibly important because figuring out that window, and we might not no 100%, but if we can figure out like a three-day window of opportunity, it's going to be significantly easier to time things in a less stressful way. This is possible. It doesn't have to be this big, scary thing. We can follow the body and follow the instinct and loosely plan and still hit that fertile window. And I think that's really important to try to help like take some of the stress um, and lack of spontaneity out of things, which is never fun, right? Number two that we hear quite a bit um, and we get asked quite a lot inside FCM when people are coming to join us is to take Mucinex. And before I actually recorded this, I was like, okay, I know what I, what the party line is. I know what I say every single time someone asks me this question, but let me just like do my due diligence here for a second. I'm going to hop onto PubMed and make sure that there isn't anything new that I haven't seen, um, that is going to debunk what I'm going to say. And the truth is, is there's just, there's no research. There's just no research. Um, and when it comes to fertility, there is a time and a place for coloring outside of the lines when it comes to best quality evidence. But in terms of like first line treatment, which is what I would say a lot of people consider Mucinex as, it's often one of the first things that you'll see online or that people tell you to try because it worked for them. It's just not it. Like it's just not it. So Mucinex is actually a cold medicine. And the premise behind it, it's, it's like, uh, oh my God, what's the term? My brain just totally lost. I don't want to say scientific name because that's not true, but it's like pharmaceutical name is, is guafenescent. I shouldn't even bother saying that. I literally can't. But anyways, it's a cold medicine. And the premise being that it will thin cervical fluid. And if it helps to thin cervical fluid, maybe the sperm can swim better. That's kind of the, the premise. Again, kind of similar to number one, like logically, I get it. I do get that, especially if you're someone that's like, I don't really see a lot of cervical fluid. Like, is this going to help me have more? We talk about how cervical fluid is so important for the pH, for sperm's ability to survive, for sperm's ability to swim. Like, it's a really big piece of the puzzle. But at the end of the day, there's nothing to really back up that that's actually going to help you get pregnant. And there's just, there's just no research. Is it harmful? No, like maybe not necessarily, but it's, it's another good example of like wasting time, money, and hope on something that is not backed in the research. I actually did find one study <laughs> and it wasn't even a true study. It was something that we call an N equals one. It was like, it was a case paper. It was a person that had this one dude and they gave him 600 milligrams of mucinex. I don't even remember for how long. And they did find that count and motility increase, but they had no idea why. And this was from years ago and no one's looked deeper into it. So is there more, and this is for men and we're obviously, we kind of focused on it as like, it's normally a, a female uh, recommendation. And it's just one of the ones I wanted to paint light towards as you're going to hear about it. You're going to see it. You're probably going to question it and maybe you're going to try it. And 
I don't want you to put a lot of stock into this being the solution for you because it's often significantly more complex than that. And if you don't have a lot of cervical fluid, first line therapy shouldn't be cold medicine. It should be, why don't I have a lot of cervical fluid? Are you drinking enough water? Are you eating enough calories? Are you specifically eating enough fat and protein? Have you checked your follicular phase estrogen? Do you have enough estrogen? Those are the types of things. How's your stress? How's your sleep? How are you moving your body? These are the types of questions that we want to be actually asking ourselves versus what's the med for that, which is basically maybe what mucinex is. But if you don't have the building blocks to make cervical fluid, or if you don't have the estrogenic stimulation for your cervix to make cervical fluid, mucinex doesn't make fluid. It doesn't make cervical fluid. It just thins it out. If you have really thick, clumpy fluid, could thinning thinning it out help? Maybe, I don't know, but it's not gonna make more. And then number three is a really popular one. This one might ruffle some feathers. Um, And there's probably people out there that aren't going to agree (laughs) what I have to say, but I stand firm in this belief. I really do. And it's one of the more popular dietary pieces of advice Um, for the fertility realm. And I unfortunately see it being given in the fertility clinic space quite frequently. And that's going keto when you're trying to get pregnant. And there's, we could probably spend multiple episodes just, and, and we have, we have spent multiple episodes talking about nutrition and fertility, but we could probably spend a good amount of time specifically talking about all the different types of diets and why or why not that's appropriate. And at the end of the day, my personal belief that is, no, I'll go there in a second. My personal belief is that there is no one size fits all diet for boosting fertility. The scientific research-based answer is like the best we have in terms of research is the Mediterranean diet. And even in some of the Mediterranean diet studies, it's still sites that like some personalization is impactful and helpful, but that is like the best we have when it comes to, when it comes to the science, when it comes to the research, the ketogenic diet, the basic premises is to remove high carbohydrate foods, eat a very, very low carbohydrate diet and a very high fat diet. And again, if we go back to like, how does this logically make sense? We know that hormones are made from cholesterol and healthy fats. So more fats, if you're someone who has low hormones, maybe that makes sense. And sure, we talk a lot about giving the building blocks, but this is something that I think I really consider to the extreme that truly just isn't really backed by the science in terms of a broad spectrum recommendation. And we're seeing it as a, oh, you can't get pregnant, eat like this recommendation versus Who are you as a person and as an individual? And how do we actually personalize this treatment plan to help boost your fertility? So I I specifically found a study actually from this year, 2024, that looked at a variety of dietary patterns and fertility, which I thought was a really good little summary that I'm actually going to put the link in the show notes for you if you are curious about some of the research and, and other diets. And they looked at like the standard Western um, diet and like how that negatively impacts and things. It's actually quite fascinating. So I highly recommend checking it out, but, um, what they kind of pulled in terms of looking at the data for keto is first and foremost, the ketogenic diet does have a lot of research in the concept of like neurology, um, and epilepsy, like tons of research, but Other than that, like we actually don't have a whole heck of a lot. And this paper in particular cited a couple of different studies, um, but all of which were specifically done in women with PCOS. Okay. So we're not going to take, oh, this works in PCOS, women who are struggling to get pregnant, therefore it must work with everyone. That's not how we're going to use this type of research. But even in the PCOS population, I'm still not convinced in all honesty. There was one paper... Um, that looked at 
women with PCOS who had a BMI of over 27 and the ketogenic diet did help them to lose weight, to improve their insulin sensitivity, to reduce their LHFSH ratio and to improve their testosterone numbers. All benefits. Yes. I'm not saying that we're not seeing some sort of benefit. Um, but again, this is not going to be the case for women across the board with PCOS. And we're still seeing it recommended as just a fertility promoting diet. And there's long-term implications that come with going keto. And I think a really important one to point out is that there's often no consideration for the type of fat that you're consuming, that a lot of times there's a lot of saturated fat that's included in the diet, um, a lot of cholesterol. And if we actually look at dietary patterns and the improvement of fertility, diets high in saturated and trans fats actually reduce fertility potential. Diets that are really high in cholesterol or people that have elevated cholesterol levels have reduced fertility potential. So there needs to be a, a better balance of this is what we see can cause a problem. Maybe this could potentially help in this small patient population, but where's the give and take? How do we make sure that it is promoting and not hindering? Another really small study that they included was 12 people. So when I say small, I mean like really small, <laughs> smaller than a classroom. Um, and these women had PCOS and they had failed IVF. And they did, um, it's so funny, they said 14 plus or minus 11 weeks. So like that's a fairly large range. So some of these women actually maybe only did three weeks of the ketogenic diet. And some of these women actually did 25 weeks of the ketogenic diet and like a whole slew in between. And they found in the women who had a significant weight loss with the diet change, improved implantation rates. So there is data, there is research with elevated BMIs and, and we can have a whole conversation around how I, I don't think totally going by BMI is appropriate. However, it's very, it's a very easy research metric, unfortunately, right? So when we're looking at the studies and when we're looking at the research, we're often talking about BMI, but how I want everyone to approach BMI and weight is it's not actually necessarily about the weight. And it's not necessarily about the weight loss that improves things. It's actually about the metabolic markers underneath, the things that are likely causing the weight gain or lack of weight loss. The weight is actually a symptom. So we want to be looking at things like blood sugar and insulin <laughs> and cholesterol. All of these things we know are modifiable risk factors for infertility. And it's that that we want to be focusing more on versus I need to lose weight. I need to reduce my BMI. We actually want to make sure that we're looking at the right metrics to make impactful change. So I just wanted to point out like, yes, this is a small study. And yes, they actually did see positive outcomes. Um, with continuing with doing keto through IVF in PCOS women. Um, I don't have the BMI and, and on hand, but it probably is included in the paper actually that I will post in the show notes for you if you're curious. But I think the moral of this story is I just shared two positive outcomes, but at the end of the day, there's a very, very, very small amount of research in very tiny, tiny patient populations. Like this one study was just 12 women. Like that's not a huge thing. And I think we can argue that even within the PCOS community, keto is still not the answer for everybody. And I think that some of that needs to have, like I said before, a little give and take. For example, your thyroid governs all of the things. We know your thyroid plays a role in fertility and your thyroid needs carbohydrates needs carbohydrates. <laughs> we can't be cutting out entire food groups and not expect to have some other implications in our hormonal cascades and in our metabolic health. Eliminating entire food groups just for me is simply never the answer. And a lot of that too comes down to induced stress from a really strict diet. And we know that stress plays a role. And what happens? What happens when you're feeling really stressed? And, you're, and you need to eat something. I will give a personal example. 
I recently ran a stool test and it showed me that my body was reacting to gluten. I did a celiac test. It came back negative. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm not, I don't need to be like uber cautious, but obviously my body in, and there's other things going on that I think is actually why I'm reacting negatively to gluten, but it was, and still actually has been very stressful for me in mo in pockets of time to fully eliminate gluten. And so I made the conscious decision that I wasn't going to force that on myself. And I was going to play around with, can I find a tolerance level, which I think I have. I think I have found a tolerance level that doesn't cause me symptoms, but still allows me a little bit of wiggle room so that I'm not increasing my stress over, oh my God, there's nothing to eat. What am I going to eat? I can't eat that. If I can't, I guess I'm not eating at all, which tends to be what happens when our diets are stressful, right? I want you to reflect on any really like restrictive diet that you have done. Have you had those moments of, wow, there's nothing here that I can have. And so you opt to have nothing at all. And in my opinion, in certain situations, obviously if you're celiac and the only option is gluten, like that is not an option on the table. I'm talking more about like food sensitivities or you making like eliminations from your diet for personal, um, specific reasons, not allergies. Okay. Um, but our rule inside fertility confidence method, because this is something that comes up a lot, especially in the summer. Um, but a lot when people are like, I am traveling, I'm going on a road trip. Like, how do I maintain these specific nutrition changes? But also how do I do that without feeling like a party pooper <laughs> either without feeling restricted? And that's something we spend a lot of time focusing and coaching and teaching on with our clients, because it's really important to me that eating doesn't feel stressful for you. Because if it does, what, like, what are we doing? You know, why are we, why are we making changes that we assume are going to be positive for our fertility, but they're just causing us more stress when we're all likely struggling with reducing our, and managing our stress in the first place? How do we make this as simple as possible? And truly the best way to make it as simple as possible is to take a personalized approach because there is no one size fits all here, especially when it comes to nutrition and food. So hopefully this conversation was helpful. We will definitely come back with more like myth debunking. If you guys like this episode, come and let me know over on Instagram at Fertility Confidence Method. If you have any tips that you're like, is this something? And maybe we'll do a part two with some of your, your personal tips and tricks that you've read about or that you've tried. Uh, and we'll keep this, we'll keep this going so that you can just get a better understanding of like what's out there, what's out there with the research. Doing your research is what is going to make sure that you're making the right decisions. And if at any time you're like, I am ready for support, I'm having a hard time navigating this on my own. And I just want to be really proactive um, and really specific and get that personalized support, come and join us in FCM. It's basically Reddit, but with doctors <laughs> monitoring, which is awesome. Um, I really want to take some like screenshots and share with you guys how similar the threads are because it, it is really, really hilarious. Um, but it is, it's doctor moderated Reddit where you can get all of your tips and tricks that are actually backed by science that are actually going to work. But beyond that and the amazing community and support space that you have to ask these questions inside FCM, you're also going to get a personalized plan. So you have me every day for office hours. You have your plan, you have your community, you have your online forum that you can go. And when you're up at night having a, a thought, we can just work that out together instead of you trying to figure it all out on your own. It's an amazing place to hang out. So I'll pop the link for you guys. If you're curious, if you have any questions, uh, you can navigate through there, book a call, and hopefully we will see you inside our very own Fertility Confidence Method forum very soon. Take care.